no longer acceptable. Businesses want capability in Google Time. They want to get smaller increments of their requirements in a few weeks. And that completely changes the dynamic in terms of what application organizations need to do to deliver results. You know, enterprise and IT really becoming one and the same. Business capability is fueled by software and innovation. And if organizations are not doing it themselves, the competition will quickly force them to figure it out. Because everything is being iterated faster and quicker in this instant on world. So what's the response from an applications organization perspective that we're seeing with our customers and with our partners? You know, we've been talking about application modernization for <coughs> many, many years. I really think it's been an agenda that people have talked about, I mean, since I've been in the business, since I've been in IT. But the urgency behind it has hit a crescendo that I have not seen before in my 20 plus uh, seasoned, grizzled seasoned years in the industry. And along with the urgency is the availability of proven architecture, technology, and methodology to support this kind of change. You know, composite application architectures, whether you're talking SOA, whether you're talking REST, whether you're talking some other Web2 um, capability, they're, pr they're proven. They're out there. Customers have been successful showing how they could re-architect and modernize their applications and deliver innovation faster while reducing costs. It's proven. Agile, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking about this the other day. I really believe we're seeing a hockey stick in terms of adoption of Agile methodology. You know, Agile, again, has been around as a methodology for many years. And I think, I, I personally believe that organizations have dabbled in Agile for quite some time. But what we're seeing now is proven examples of true success in shrinking cycle time and increasing responsiveness by employing Agile methodology in the organization. So we're seeing almost a race how quickly organizations can get right with Agile, figure out how to make it work in their organization. And the idea of a centralized development team is no longer. Whether you're offshoring, outsourcing, or just developing a composite application by bringing multiple teams um, virtually together to deliver against the release, that's a reality. But, and I think the second point is also really critical, we're not giving them a hall pass to lower quality, to lower their focus on security and performance. If anything, the stakes are so much higher in terms of maintaining quality levels that are expected and growing them, maintaining performance, and ensuring security. And cloud is, is really raising the, the stakes here as well. When you're talking about delivering all or part of your application or consuming services from the cloud to deliver against a business process, you have got to be rock solid on security. You have to hit your performance SLAs, and you have to do it in a dynamic environment where you can't necessarily plan ongoing consumption. Elasticity becomes critical, absolutely raising the stakes. So it's these three um, vectors that are coming together that I think are, are putting incredible stresses on the way that application teams are required to work together and deliver new business capability. Again, people are racing towards taking advantage of cloud where it makes sense for scalability, elasticity, and economy. They're driving architectural standards into the organization to get the modularity and agility to be able to respond more quickly to business requirements and reuse and lower overall costs of innovation. And they're looking to employ Agile in as many projects as it makes sense so that they can get that delivery of new capability faster to their constituencies, not make them wait three, six, nine months, but deliver under a month even new capability. Um, one other thing I want to mention, and then I'm going to take a, a moment, take a breath, and see if there's any questions up front on the, on the setup, is that we're also seeing not only this race to adopt and take advantage of composite application architecture, leverage the cloud for delivery of services or consumption of services where it makes sense, 
and get right with Agile, figure out where to employ Agile methodology to iterate faster. But we're also seeing a fundamental shift in the role that IT is playing in terms of how they make this all happen. And this is something else that HP, we've really talked about for quite a while now. But I think it's an important point to make in the context of this whole set of trends that applications teams are facing. When you talk about delivering a composite application to support a set of business requirements, whether it be supporting a business process or a new set of business capabilities, and you have the opportunity to deliver that business process or that set of capability more economically quicker by using cloud-based services as well as internally developed services, you essentially become a service provider, a broker of technology as well as a builder. And that also puts a set of expectations and an assumption that control and governance becomes even more important from an IT organization. So we're also seeing a set of specific requirements and needs evolving out of the shift in role of the IT leader, of the application teams and the project managers in, a, in an application organization. If IT gets their arms around this and is able to make the cultural shift to this role, able to address the unique challenges of leveraging the cloud, whether it be to deploy applications or consume services, start to absorb the idea of composite application architecture and implement it for modularity and responsiveness, and start to iterate faster. And what they see is a better opportunity to respond to their competitors. They see a lowering of that percentage of budget that's going to keep the lights on, more cost freed up for innovation, and ultimately they're going to see benefit to the bottom line as a business. By better alignment between the business and IT and faster responsiveness, resulting in better solutions for end user customers. So these are some of the benefits you see. So those are just the, that's kind of the backstory or the specific challenges that are really driving the areas that we're innovating and the, and the specific solutions that you're going to see being demoed today. And I'm going to go start to set the stage in terms of what those solutions are. Before I do that, I want to stop right here and just see if there's any questions on the background. Yes? Uh, uh, we heard at SAP Sapphire, they talked a lot about um, cycle times around rolling out apps, in particular mm -hmm. SAP. <laughs> it's used to those you know, yeah. zillion dollar deals over 24 months. Mm -hmm. um, but it's getting shorter and mobility is a big part of it. The question that we're hearing a lot is the how question. Mm -hmm. IT is not used to being a service provider at that level. Yeah, there's been service catalog stuff out there, but uh, specifically the how question. Um, so the question is, um, what are you guys seeing as the key inhibitor? Is it the how do I get there? Um, and what are the core business projects that seem to be the most uh, prime time, if you will, for, for the cloud? and because most of the people are just doing kind of like uh, proof of concepts and you know, stuff here and there, now dabbling in, in key, but not, I haven't seen any real business projects like end-to-end, -end, this business project was cloud. Mm -hmm. So can you just talk about the how, what are the how questions, and yeah. then what specific apps are prime time right now? Absolutely. Yeah, let me take, take the question as kind of a two-parter. Um, and I know we have some folks on the phone as well, so I'll go ahead and repeat the question um, for the folks on the phone. And there's so 60 people on the live stream right now too. So with an angle on TV. So. Excellent. Okay. So I'll, I'll say hello to the 60 people on the live stream as well. So the first part of the question is how. What are we seeing in terms of uh, the, the unique challenges or, or the things that customers are addressing in terms of how can they get there um, to this perspective of being more of a broker of services, of being more responsive? And there's multiple thoughts to that. And the first one in terms of being more responsive um, it's really the three, or a couple of the dynamics that I talked about. One of the areas, one of the main things that we're seeing people do to become more responsive is implement um, software uh, development, application lifecycle management methodologies that support, that, that drive closer alignment with the business, shorter iterations for smaller sets of functionality. So if you think about the concept of iterative approaches like Agile and Agile-like or hybrid solutions, there's a fundamental expectation 
that the business analyst role, the, the, imp the users that are, um, or the, the uh, folks that are really the linchpin between the business users themselves and the development teams have a seat at the table on, on an ongoing basis. The developers have a seat at the table. The testers have a seat at the table. And the set of traditional requirements are broken down more granularly into user stories. And the set of user stories that you're addressing is a smaller grouping, but delivered in a shorter time frame. Now, why is this important? As business needs change quickly, and that's just kind of the reality of today, um, and you may remember the, the quote that Matt used earlier about 40% for traditional software life cycle, there's 40% rework. What we're trying to do is squeeze that out of there. So we're, we're driving a set of best practices and a model amongst our teams that is constant collaboration, shorter iteration, and much more um, organic discussion and alignment with the business at the table. Business and IT at the same table. Now, there's that actually requires a change in the way people are doing their work. And it requires removing <coughs> silos both technically and culturally between organizations. So first of all, you need to get business and IT at the table together, fundamentally realizing that IT is, is a fundamental aspect of business success. And there are sometimes is resistance there. So you gotta cut through that that barrier first. The second is you've got to get dev and test at the table together. And that can also, I've had many discussions with customers about the trust aspect of that and you need to bring that together. And then what you're going to be seeing today in the software is how do you deliver a software framework that allows the different participants to stay in the tools that they know and are successful in utilizing and I, I want to say know and love almost, um, but allow them to participate in this governed process. And that's a unique set of challenges too. One of the things you don't want to do is, is tell your teams that, well, we're going we're to deploy agile methodology, we're going to iterate faster. Oh, and by the way, we all want you to move off your tools, your IDEs, your source code management tools, your requirements management tools, and adopt this brand new thing that you don't have any familiarity with and do these 12 extra steps. That's mm -hmm. not the right answer. So, well, them the so, so on the developer side, how would yeah. you categorize the environment? I mean, IT for the past 10 years has been challenged, cost cutting, and mm -hmm. you know, it's been a brutal environment. Now with virtualization, it's been a real explosion of, of innovation and investments. Mm -hmm. So some are saying, and, and some we're saying that the developer is lagging the consumer market. So if you look at the consumer market, the software frameworks are a lot of open source tools. Mm -hmm. So that's a real rabid environment for developers, and it's been productive. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are you seeing the same innovation in the enterprise um, and you know some of those open source things like Puppet, Hadoop are now mm -hmm. on the table yeah. and being really key software environments for the developers. So, 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 so are they there? Are they uh, so you know, on a scale of one to ten? Ten being they're completely peaked. Are they at a two? So, probably around two. I would say the large, you know, enterprise. So it depends really where in the enterprise. So if you look at the web front end. This is probably most enterprises are already there. But the web front end, it's going to be a small, and depends if it's a financial or somebody who's really not, you know, no, there's no really a business driving through the website. But really, we see these areas are getting more modern, more open source, more new, you know, dev stacks, etc. Um, on the other hand, where you have the SAP and Oracle, you know, we still have you know mainframe running in many uh, large enterprises. So I would say it's going to be a gradual thing over the years. What we're trying to really do is help our customers accelerate that and really make that transition faster. Uh, but it really is, you know, if you you know, we have over 3,000 different applications running in HPIT, you know. A lot of them are moving agile, but it's still very far from being a majority. It's a really good point, Rafi, and, and I think one of the key messages I want to get across is that the kinds of software solutions and best practices that we're putting forth are to enable organizations to put the right infrastructure in place when they're ready to make the move. So you give them kind of the guardrails, if you will, allow them to accelerate as fast as they always have, but keep the guardrails on so you know the developers don't go off the cliff. Um, and Rafi's absolutely right in that if you were to look under the covers of any large organization, large enterprise, you're going to see certain applications and certain groups 
that are primed for adopting things like Agile. You know, and, and especially uh, employee engagement applications, and customer facing web two type of things. You're gonna see some applications, traditional back office, highly secure data, things that are on the mainframe that are going to continue to utilize the traditional enterprise release mechanism because of just the fundamental dynamics and implications of a change, the cost of a change. And there's not that driving desire in that context to have this, this rapid iteration. Is you, are seeing mobile, I mean, obviously we're hearing, obviously the iPad, we said Citrix Synergy and, mm -hmm. and SAP Sapphire, and they're talking about the iPad, the CIO gets the iPad and tells IT, okay, now make this work. Yeah. That's kind of like the, 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 the yeah. bumper sticker. But really, how does that impact the, the IT role in terms of, uh, you know, analytics, bi real-time, business intelligence, those mm -hmm. kinds of things? Yeah, mobile. Can you share, mm -hmm. share some thoughts on that? Sure, yeah, mobile is, is we're seeing it widespread. And, you know, it's interesting, it's not a primary focus of the uh, elements that we're announcing today, but it is a, a uh, it's permeating everything we're talking about. In fact, I even think in the demo there might be a little yeah. tip off to mobile somewhere. I don't want to give away the thunder. But yes, we are absolutely, absolutely seeing it. I um, was at our HP Discover uh, event last month, and I was sitting in a, a group of our top customers, top enterprises. It was a customer advisory meeting. And we were talking about things like agile adoption, about how many you know, quality center ALM projects are you grappling with. And it seemed like the conversation turned back to mobile very frequently in, in that meeting. I mean, if you think about most enterprises today, if you're talking about, say, travel, you know, access to, to airline, you're talking about a major airline, mobile applications are on the top of their list. You're talking about financials, mobile banking is at the top of the list. There's an expectation because of how we all live our daily lives with our um, smartphones and our, our tablets, that engaging and interacting with the business is going to be able to be done over the mobile platform. So it puts a set of requirements on the development teams and on the testing teams and on the management teams. I also think it does ratchet up the expectation that you iterate more quickly because we're, we're all used to our smartphone apps. I think every other time I log into my smartphone, I've got 25 new app updates. And, and yeah, these are you know consumer applications like maybe a, a news feed or, or a game, but it's permeating the mindset of customers out there. So yes, we're seeing that significantly impacting the way that we deliver. Applications. Well, uh, final uh, final question sure. on this one is uh, it's not being talked about much, but. Um, it's kind of being talked about much, uh, is the risk management side of IT. So that's coming up on the CIO's agenda. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the dreaded, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley, all the reporting, and especially with cloud and specifically got multi-tenancy security, all these kind of you know, can of worms. So what is the risk management deliverable? Is it on the, is it on the, the car, the, the business report card you guys shown earlier? And, and what in the software can you guys point to and what trends mm -hmm. are you seeing for the risk management side of IT and yep, what are yep. the core issues there? Very good question. Uh, again, for the folks on the phone, a question around risk management and how do we how do we surface that in our solutions and, and what are we seeing or what are we delivering from a software perspective? And yes, you're absolutely right. There are definitely KPIs and um, metrics that we're measuring and delivering through the IT performance suite scorecards that are risk management oriented. And then as you get down into particular personas or roles, there's very specific ri risk management metrics and measures. Uh, for instance, if you're talking about the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer, they have a very specific set of risks that they're dealing with in terms of application security risk, um, just the whole implication of a data breach. I mean, we've all heard the story so many times about credit card companies getting data breached and the cost to the business. And so we have tailored solutions that leverage the underlying technology IP and capability um, in terms of how we can test and measure vulnerabilities in applications, whether they're in development or, or in live production. And then we roll that information up and map it against business uh, levers, business objectives, and measure that and deliver it as a governance and risk um, report card or scorecard. So one of the challenges that organizations face when you talk about risk management is cost versus risk threshold, right? So you can't secure everything. You can't cover every corner or the cost mushroom and you have no money left for innovation. So it's how to find that, that perfect inflection point between the level of risk and the cost you're willing to incur. And we, we provide um, layers, analytical layers on top of our software that allows you to work with that, to put in your business concerns 
uh, put in thresholds and then apply levels of security. We do the same with quality. We've had risk-based quality management for years. The idea is that you can um, basically determine based on business parameters the amount of testing you want to do and the amount of resources you want to apply to different components of your applications or your composite uh, solutions. Um, and then we can surface that in the form of metrics through the performance suite. So background there. So any other questions? We have a lot of different, different <coughs> related and important aspects of what we're announcing today. So what I want to do now is take the next level down and talk specifically about four main challenges that we're seeing surfacing for IT organizations as they move towards wanting to be more agile and responding to the business and taking advantage of, if you will, these technology and um, methodology best practices around leveraging cloud where it makes sense, driving composite and nimble application architectures and iterating faster with Agile. And we see four things that really put stress points on the process of delivering applications. And the first is managing change. And you know, this is something I've talked about for a long time from an applications perspective. As we leverage these new architectures, these new technologies, these methodologies to break things into smaller parts that are supposedly more nimble, easier to change, and um, more people are interacting with them, you get what I like to say the M plus N problem mushroom to the M by N problem in very short order. And so how someone keeps track of all of those moving parts across distributed teams, across components and services, um, across iterations, without intelligence and automated <coughs> solutions, lifecycle management, it becomes virtually impossible. You know, it's interesting, a lot of people, the, or the whole idea behind Agile methodology was very lightweight, very fast iteration, <coughs> almost tool, uh, not, think, not thinking of the word, but almost like you don't really need tools. Just iterate, bring everybody into a room, stand up meetings, get yellow sticky notes on the board, and boom, you have Agile. Well, that's great if everybody can get in the room <coughs> and you're dealing with a single application module, but that's not reality for a majority of the enterprises today. We're talking composite applications and distributed development teams and possibly even inclusion of a third-party cloud service in that application delivery. So application lifecycle management really bubbles up as a primary concern for applications teams and a primary focus area. A lot of people have asked me in the past, how do you know that now is the right time to be looking at investing in application lifecycle management software. And it's truly this, this M times N problem, this change management problem that I think is the primary driver for the benefits that organizations get out of ALM, application lifecycle management. Along with managing change, you can't change it if you can't see it. So visibility becomes uber critical in this new world. And having visibility across the different work streams, the different teams that are responsible for the ultimate delivery of the application, and the interrelationships between what one, one team does and how it impacts another is very critical. So you're going to see today the innovations we've put into our application lifecycle management platform <coughs> to provide what I like to call actionable intelligence. The idea is you're going to surface up information related to what people are doing, the changes they're making, in the context of the impact of that change to the overall goal of the team responsible for delivering the application. It's not enough just to surface up everything. I mean, you, can, you can get buried in data and, not, and be completely polarized in terms of what to do. What you want to do is surface up intelligence, actionable information that drives a decision around what step do I take next and where am I at in terms of achieving my goal with the application. So you're going to see that in our application lifecycle intelligence capability that we put into our ALM platform. <coughs> Agile methodology, again, I, I think I've probably uh, beaten the dead horse here on why it's important, you know, iterating faster, but I think the big payoffs come when you bring together the concept of Agile adoption of the methodology and being able to iterate faster in a governed, managed way. So when you're talking about distributed teams, collaborating to develop and deliver 
a multi-step business process or a composite application or enterprise release, and you want to do it in a more agile fashion, you need to be able to have that agile view, support the methodology, but have it overlay the intelligence, the information, and the management that keeps everyone in between those guardrails, you know, that keeps everyone moving towards the goals of the project on time, on budget, and doesn't let risk enter the equation in such a way that you easily fall off the cliff in terms of what you're trying to deliver. And finally, constraints. You know, we've talked a little bit already about virtualization and service virtualization, a little bit of a teaser. One of the fundamental issues with adopting architectures like composite applications and leveraging cloud services to get economies of scale, to get change faster in the organization, to get reused so you can free up more dollars for innovation, is that you're fundamentally breaking up what an application is, you're creating dependencies across teams, and you can't keep everybody marching on the same timetable. Constraints are going to enter the equation. And one of the biggest challenges I've seen with a lot of large customers in terms of their desire to iterate faster and deliver faster solutions gets stymied because they just can't get there from here. Really good example, you may have a multi-step business process you're trying to evolve that has a dependency on a third-party service, maybe for doing credit check, and has a dependency on gathering a piece of customer data out of a production system that IT is controlling. You want to you develop new capability, you want to test that capability functionally, test the data streams, test performance, and you're told, well, you can't do performance testing because every time you hit that third-party service, they're going to charge you and we can't afford that. Oh, and you want to do functional testing? Well, okay, we can give you access to that production service at 2 a.m. next Tuesday. Sit on your hands until then. You know, I hear this scenario play out over and over again. So. IT application organizations need to employ strategies, and now there's available technology to help them, to how they're going to be able to keep the pressure on enough testing, enough development, hit the cycle, hit the budget, hit the schedule. And solutions for eliminating constraints really bubble to the top of one of the needs in moving in this area. I'm going to stop there and see if there's any questions on these four fundamental issues that really present themselves. What, what are you seeing as some of the of the problems that may come you know, with the developers when they have that IT. Kind of more the DevOps kind of thing? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. for instance, through our service, for instance, road, uh, you know, uh, you know, road virtualized networks and yeah. inside and inside. Mm -hmm. Very, very good question. Some of the challenges we're seeing with developers being ahead of IT. Um, that is, I, in particular, have seen a couple of scenarios there that uh, really require sharing of information between the two organizations and more of the drive to put the processes in place and put the management structures in place to support more of the DevOps. I'm going to address two, two aspects. Um, first of all, the, the whole idea of the vir virtualized network or, or um, putting something out there in production that you're not aware of really requires I believe operations to be thinking about how they can deploy technology that can discover those kinds of capabilities. Um, discover services on a network, discover new technology, and feed that into their centralized uh, systems of record of what they have running so, in production. So try to understand what's actually, what actually people are doing out there? Right, right. Yeah, like on the SOA side, I'm real familiar with this because I used to work directly on this product. Uh, you know, we had the ab ability in HP to deploy discovery agents that could discover services out on the network, feed that information into our CMDB, and then share that with our governance repository, our system at governance repository, so that you can see, based on what you think, your model of what you think you have deployed, how that maps to what's actually out there. So what happens if they make that discovery? Well, then you need the management structure to manage it. So now you need to have the, the ability to go to the development teams and say, okay, we need to assess what's out there. Why is it there? What need haven't we been able to address? And can we put assurances? I mean, is it going to be okay to keep that out there? Or that's do we need to bring it back in, add some layers of governance or security to it, and then push it back out? That's where everything can go wrong, really. Right? 
that's the challenge. You need to have not just the technology, but you need to have the management structures, the communication loops, the, um, the it's like this, this fine line between governance and complete lockdown. And you, need to, you don't want to have complete lockdown. You don't want to have 100% your freedom. You want to have some controls in place what's <coughs> most important to the business so that you can have those conversations about, we need this capability, but it has to be in between the guardrails because we can't afford the risk of just letting completely ungoverned complications. But, but, but definitely, I mean, open source, now developers could just download, use whatever tools they want. They don't need to go to IT to procure anything. The same with cloud. They could go and just get a bunch of machines running on Amazon. They don't need to go and buy any hardware. So we see all of our enterprise customers are having these challenges where the different IT teams are running forward, each within their own tools, practices, and, and they really don't need them for many things. Okay, it's, it's the developers, but it's, it's across IT. I mean, even backup, I, you know, I could use HP's supported backup, but I could also always go to iBackup or whatever it is and just now very easily use other tools. Uh, a, a lot of are you saying here that you're going to be able to monitor that, whether they're going to be able to, what they're, you know, what they're actually going out and using? So, and we'll, we'll demo today, and that's a lot of our partnership <coughs> with TaskRop here. We figured that we really can't tell developers what to use or do. Yeah, because that it seems like what that happens is you do that, like you said, these yeah. control systems. Exactly. You say you can't do that. It they go say, well, forget it. I'm going to bring in my own device. Exactly. I'm on my own. No, I'm off my iPhone. Uh, 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 Absolutely. Exactly. So, yeah. so I, I think that's exactly the approach we're going to be taking, and, and we, we actually did, and we'll demo some of the things. We, we let developers use whichever tools they want. Also, it's so rapidly changing that even if we, you know, suggest something or, you know, the, the technology stack keep on changing so fast that it's very hard even just to keep track on that. But what we can do is go and integrate and bring that information in to a place that at least you get visibility for control. So what we'll demo today is, you know, we can have developers use whichever <coughs> open source or commercial source control management tool, build management tool, ID they want. We'll just plug in to get that visibility and we'll demo today exactly how we do that. So in a non-disruptive way, we're able to just bring in the developers to that application lifecycle management, let them do what they're on, you know, what they're doing daily. Hopefully, provide additional value for them, and definitely let management get visibility into control into what's actually happening. Pardon me for being skeptical, but I've been to a few of these briefings where a vendor says, "Just plug in something." So, could you give me some specific? How many IDEs? How many source code managers? I mean, you must. There must be a, a relatively short list or a relatively no, long list? A long list. It's so a very long list. <laughs> so, so maybe I should ask you the question. <laughs> yeah, but, but tool on what, 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 what's happened is the developers have driven this just, you know, open source into the enterprise, it's heterogeneity, and they, they actually, you know, I completely agree with Kelly, they, they need to be productive, but they can't have a hall pass and there'd be no governance in their So have you found any IDEs that don't integrate with you? Well, we've selected the IDEs, especially Eclipse and Visual Studio and Eclipse-based IDEs as the, the predominant IDEs, the ones with the majority market share in the enterprise. So there are the other IDEs like NetBeans and, you know, IntelliJ IDEA, which are not a primary focus because they're, you know, they're smaller, they're, they're the niche players and small, smaller business. And how business. long would it take you to integrate those? Uh, it's a humongous effort, what you'll see today. This is not the sort of, again, an embracing developers and providing this level of governance over them so that, you know, the organization, the, the inmates don't run the entire asylum. Um, so don't we need an agile project to integrate in the yes. other... Yeah, so this is really what we're trying to do, and I think what this is where the demos will speak for themselves. You'll see the level of investment in bringing this to the developer's home environment so the data can be there in those systems of record that you can automate reporting on. I'm going to shut up because I want to oh. really see the demo. Okay, great. And, and I can actually even wrap up a little bit uh, early so we have a little more time for the demo, which may actually make more sense given where everybody's at. So really, really good discussion. Just to put a little bit more context in the answer that I gave before, I was actually coming at it a, a little bit more from the perspective of developers developing capability to push out into production that the business is going to use to service their operations or their customers, but this, uh, what Rafi brought up is also an aspect of the discussion that's really critical and, and a key um, 
uh, attribute that organizations are facing today, which is what the developers actually use every day to do their development. And that's also a whole other dynamic that you're going to get to see how we can give the developers best of both worlds the ability to develop on the tools that they want, the open source tools, yet have some governance. Yeah. Uh, just final question before you wrap sure. up. I'm mean, obviously it's very disruptive and self-service. It's great having all that new tools and everything, uh, but it's very disruptive to the service industry. And, you know, the classic Accentures who mm -hmm. you know, they make money by doing the zillion dollar 24 month rollouts, mm -hmm. which is not what's on the on the agenda for enterprises these days. They want to do it in months, mm -hmm. like two, three months, not 24 months. Mm -hmm. You know, big business software rollouts with the whole you know the things you guys are proposing. So what's happening in your from HP's perspective that you see in the trends? on the delivery side, the mm -hmm. consultants out there, the guys who are making all the money in the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. What's changing there? Is it obviously more developer focused? Um, the big guys out there like CSC and Accentures of the world and boutiques, what's the, give very us the overview of that. Very good question, how, is all, how are all these dynamics changing kind of the makeup of the services, the service providers out there? And, and I think you're seeing it on a number of different factors. It's both a risk and an opportunity. So uh, if I think about HP and enterprise services and our partners, there's whole new classes of services coming, being made available now. So, uh, you know, services around methodology and best practice, helping customers figure out how to get agile right or how to move to the cloud, cloud architectural assessments, a lot of those new services. We're also seeing more managed services coming to the forefront. Um, you know, HP announced recently, I think it was <coughs> about a month or a month that, about a month ago, we announced private cloud for test. The idea of helping organizations employ a private cloud infrastructure to dynamically provision testing environments and how to put the, the technology and the process behind that to reduce costs and become more scalable. So you're really seeing a shift in the mix of what service providers can provide out there. So it is actually still a great opportunity for service providers. I'm just a little bit different makeup. So it's a classic case of innovate or die kind of thing for the existing ones? Is that what you're saying? Innovate or die for everyone, actually. <laughs> and, and, and the top <laughs> services you're seeing, that the new services are, can you just re give me those new services? Architectural services yep. around mm -hmm. composite application, cloud, uh, methodology services around things like Agile, um, and uh, any services that address utilizing aspects of hybrid delivery, whether it's bringing and building a private cloud or operating in a hybrid where you have some internal capability, some external cloud capability, how you govern that, cloud brokering, cloud governance, those kinds of services are, are very much in demand now. Thanks. Thank you. Have you seen service providers bringing more developers to try to help alleviate these issues and adopting these types of processes themselves to help with the IT operations? I am definitely seeing in, in, in some of the service providers that I've worked with mm -hmm. more development resources coming in. I don't have exact numbers and information. We could probably give you a little bit more granular information on that by talking to some of our folks in the services organization, but I have seen the trend. Yeah. I mean, that's, a key, that's a key conversation because everyone who defines cloud, they talk about if I don't own it or I rent it, that's cloud. So that's something that's a very simple definition. So with cloud and multi-tenancy and these outsourced service, technology services, SaaS or, you know, PaaS or IaaS, mm -hmm. you're, you're seeing those developing. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if that's going to be disruptive or opportunity for the software environment, because it, is it in-house self-service or is it a combination of both with the hybrid? Yeah, so I, I think it's a great, it's, it's a disruptive opportunity, if you will. <laughs> How's that for an answer? Um, it, it's actually a great opportunity from a software and a service provider perspective because there are, you can kind of think of it as a continuum. So there's a number of different factors that you have to bring into the equation in terms of what are your business goals, what are your core competencies, what are your resource goals, as to whether you're going to take something, a capability, and deliver it traditionally in a data center, whether you're going to build out a private cloud type infrastructure to deliver that capability. And this, is, this kind of goes back to that slide that I put up about IT as a broker of services. We're seeing uh, many organizations move to a model where in order to optimize investment for innovation and the interaction with stakeholders, they set up a private cloud um, infrastructure internally and people request provisioning of a service and you've got bill back and those kinds of capabilities. And then leveraging where it makes sense, public cloud services to complete the set of requirements for composite applications. So it, it brings, there's different aspects to success in the different models. Isn't that more of like an internal platform development thing? 
that's part of it. There's definitely platform implications when you talk about something like private cloud. You want to build out an internal infrastructure that will support rapid provisioning, elasticity, um, consumption management, governance, consumption governance. So there are, there are definitely requirements that get driven into what the IT organization needs to be from a platform perspective and JP has solutions in that area. Um, but there's also uh, process implications, um, interaction, measurement, what gets measured, what's important and how teams engage and interact, uh, the whole governance model from a process perspective has implications as well. So getting off the subject a little bit, but it's a great conversation. So I wanted to put this slide up just real quickly. Uh, for most of you, if you, if you saw our ALM 11 launch in December, are you mostly familiar with the ALM 11 launch? Um, this is really the visual that embraced um, the strategy behind what we're delivering from an ALM perspective. ALM 11 as, as a software platform, we see is the, the um, unified platform for managing the aspects of delivering an application from requirements all the way to readiness for delivery. And we also expose and integrate upstream and downstream aspects of the life cycle because we firmly believe that the life of an application starts from concept and doesn't end until required, uh, retirement. So the idea that you integrate back up into the portfolio, application portfolio management side of the equation and you integrate down into operations with the kind of information, metadata, processes that make it easier to deploy and understand change um, in operations is key as well. And we call that our core life cycle, which is the aspect that ALM 11 manage directly, requirements, intelligence, development integration, quality testing, performance and security, and then the complete life cycle, which picks up the upstream aspects, portfolio management, and downstream ongoing operations availability, and eventually archiving. So that's really the concept behind our ALM platform. That's the foundation for these new innovations that you're going to see today all work with ALM. And ALM 11 was all about enabling IT organizations in this dynamic world of composite applications, cloud, agile, constant change, to restore the fundamental aspects of excellence and delivery, to restore predictability, to restore flexibility and response to change, while maintaining, and remember the, the first slide that I put up, no one gets a hall pass on quality, performance, and security. Is there a question? Could you, if you're feeling able to position ALM 11 with respect to products like Solution Manager from SAP <coughs> or the IBM National mm -hmm. ALM suite, mm -hmm. can you a sense of where you think it stands competitively? Mm -hmm. Sure, good question. Um, in terms of ALM 11, these uh, vis IBM National, SAP, Solman. Um, so certainly, the I IBM has an ALM solution. They, their, their overarching solution is Jazz. Rational components contribute to Jazz. Um, it's in the same market space as HP ALM 11. Our approach, slightly different than IBM, we believe that the unified platform, the common architecture, gives a lot of benefits in terms of being able to expose intelligence and understand the implications of changes and, and work stream activities between teams uh, in a more simplified way that determines, that delivers an ROI faster. And isn't that analytics though? Really it's really, it's a number of things. When you talk about a unified platform, you're talking about a common data model, shared repository, shared process, um, shared analytics. Uh, the IBM approach is a little bit more of an integration story. So they're just, they're different approaches to solving the ALM solution. Um, I'm actually less familiar with Solman, okay. so I probably don't want to dive into that so one. I think it's I mean Solman is going to be very SAP specific, <coughs> right? mm -hmm. one thing. The second thing is our approach is uh, specifically on the dev stack. It's a very heterogeneous approach. We look at everything almost as composite applications. And we see w we're not trying to kind of push any specific dev stack in there. Uh, but rather help you manage that process. So as you'll see through today, the areas that we take part in or the areas that we're not, 
is we look at application lifecycle management, we see areas that we see customers successfully standardize on, and we see areas which we think it's impossible to standardize on, like source control management tool. Um, so I, I think that that's going to be the core of where you see our, our strategy is different. I mean, you have Microsoft Visual Studio as well. I, I mean, this is a space we, we play in. Uh, however, we try and get away from the specific development technology, but rather support the process around it. So this is this is our. We'll come back to this many times. Yeah, today. I'll cover so it. So I'm I'm not going to go into detail here. These are the components of ALM 11. You're going to see them in action. I think seeing them in action is more exciting than a architecture. So what I'm going to set the stage now because I am very rapidly running out of time. I thought I was going to give you more time, but somehow the conversations always tend to fill up the space, uh, which I am, I enjoy that as well. Because uh, you're going to see the concept of what we've been talking about, uh, the concepts of the benefits of ALM, employing an ALM approach, building in analytics and visibility, supporting multiple methodologies like Agile, and employing techniques like virtualization to eliminate constraints. You're going to see it in action with an actual business process which is delivered through a composite application architecture. So what the team is going to share with you today is an interesting business process around um, the uh, order management of consumer products like the HP beer and a set of requirements to leverage cloud and make changes to support scalability from a holiday perspective. Um, I don't want to steal any more of their thunder, so I, did we have a, um, a break built in or are we ready to roll right into the, uh, the demo? I, I think we could go yeah. to the demo. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> great. So any other questions for me before I turn it over? Really appreciate your uh, your time and energy, and, and now let's see it in action. So I'm going to turn it over to Rocky.